Good times. But uh, we'll start off with the Essendon Football Club, who finished eighth. So they're the first team we're going to talk about, and we're going to go move up through uh, to first position. If anyone's watching this on YouTube, we're going to indiv- upload this as individual clips. Uh, and if you want to listen to the whole podcast at once, we are currently on Spotify. But don't forget, we did say previously we're on a new Spotify, pod- new Spotify, and new po- uh, podcast uh, sort of. We're a new podcast, if that makes sense. You have to search us again, and it's got the newer profile. A new host, if that makes sense. Yes, yes, that was episode four. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll start off with Essendon. Um, and in terms of, uh, I guess a good way to look at it is the, the context of where Essendon were going into this year. Having lost three key players, you would say, through Saad, Danaher, and uh, the third one's just oh, Razio. Yeah, th- those three in particular are leaving the club. And uh, obviously a new coach as well with Ben Rutten. There was a bit of talk about, you know, Essendon could, you know, fall down to the bottom regions of the ladder um, or they could stabilise. And in fact, they, uh, they actually improved. So they finished eighth with a record 11 and 11, a percentage of 109.1%. And they, were ex- they exited in the elimination final. Bush, generally, what did you make of Essendon? I was pleasantly surprised. Like they sort of had like that similar to Port Adelaide, where they took a few kids high and sort of mm. let them inject something into their team, and you saw it kind of pan out. And the other guys fed off it. Speaking of a new hope, Darcy Parish has given Essendon fans a new hope with the, a career best season. We're on fire today, <laughs> <laughs> bloody oh. But yeah, the Darcy Parish emerging was very important for him because people were sort of questioning beyond merit how their midfield's really going to stack up against some of the powerhouses of the comp. Yep. But Parrish stepping in and stepping up sort of answered some of those questions. Almost became the player they recruited Dylan Shield to be. You know, yeah. when, they, when they invested heavily in a, in a big A-grade midfielder and then they had one emerge from within. I think any time you unearth a genuine A-grade midfielder, it's a massive win. The thing is they've been banking on him because he was a pick five like a f- mm. few years ago. They were banking on him becoming this player. It's sort of taken him the time to get there. So he, he's sort of like the epitome of showing patience with these kids, especially because he was such a slight-bodied... Yep. Not and a physical base when he first came in. He was just a silky sort of dude. And tr- and another sort of positive uh, story for what happens when you play a player in their original position. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it's much easier said than done when the player's slight-bodied, like you say. Uh, they need to do their bit of an apprenticeship on the forward line. But sometimes we've seen, um, and I've seen it at my club, players tend to get lost out there. So it's good to see that he's come back to uh, playing as a pure midfielder and he's also, uh, you know... But yeah, he was all Australian this year, wasn't yeah. he? So. And he won pretty much every medal you could win besides the Brownlow and the Norm, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. And um, in a couple of those medals came in losses as well. Um, yeah. Generally speaking, with the positives, you touched on it already, the draftees came in good, in particular Archie Perkins and Nick Cox. Yeah. Um, just about. Zach Raid didn't really play too much. No, that's he's right. He's getting there. He's top okay. That's true. I think, yeah. he, I think some people say that you know he's the best of the three. I don't know how accurate that is because I mm. just don't know that, him that well but I think a key position defender is something that he can definitely look to develop so him coming good uh, would, would be great result but in top, on top of that just having to uh, Cox in particular was considered by many the, the rising star um, even though Luke Jackson that was petered out yeah that's right that's right uh, speaking of Peter, excuse me. Speaking of Peter, out that ruined my joke. Uh, Peter Wright was recruited as well as Nick Hine, so they've also done some of the best trading out of any club this year. They traded Nick Hine for peanuts and Peter Wright. They got as a salary dump. So. Hine did probably be worth a mention for a recruit of the year, like in the conversation. Absolutely, I, I think probably the recruit of the year. Oh, Alia Alia would be the yeah. other. Are you go Alia Alia? To probably go Alia. Yeah. But uh, Nick Hine, in terms of certainly what they would gave. Actually, up for you him. could sort of say Hine because he spent a lot less compared to Alia. Alia was a higher profile acquisition. You spent more to get him, whereas Hine was just a a shrewd pickup that was available to him. Well, both were bargains because Aaliyah yeah. was um, a future second or a second. So he, Something like They that. got him pretty cheap. You're right, though. Hind was basically a fourth rounder. Yeah. So, um, yeah. No, it, really astute off-season in general from Essendon that paid off in their first season. And Peter Wright emerging as a genuine key forward target for him as well as another part of their list oh. that they needed to And address. a secondary ruck. He's probably better as that secondary ruck. Absolutely. Two meter Peter. Bagging seven against the team that made the grand final. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great <laughs> effort. Uh, I've got a few notes here on Parrish. He's had averaged 30 and a half disposals this year to earn his first All-Australian Blazer. Uh, 13 and a half of those are the contested 7.6 clearances, 7.6 score involvements. Uh, and he finished top five in the league for those categories as well. So, yeah, that just, that just demonstrates how good he was this year. Stringer, in the second half of the year, was apparently the number one rated player by some metric that I don't know, but it doesn't matter. But he was genuinely really, really good um, as that sort of explosive forward mid-type. Laverde and Stewart uh, down back as well were very, very good. It was just a season of wins for Essendon, to be honest. Uh, for a team that came eighth, uh, the positives well and truly... Um, 
outshadow the negatives. Are there any performances that you can think of that you really stood out for you with Essendon? Nothing too sort of crazy. Like the game where Parrish sort of had the, I think it was 44 touches or whatever, is the mm-hmm. most touches ever for Essendon. That was a pretty... That's right. Was that in the Dreamtime game? Yeah, I think it was Dreamtime. I think time. it was a dream. I got another game they lost. <laughs> um, they they did have some. I think they had four ten goal wins this year as well. Um, they held Adelaide to their lowest score ever. They came over and beat the Eagles in Perth when we didn't know the Eagles were about to turn to shit. But I, I think you got to give Essendon mm. a lot of credit for that. That was a really good win. Uh, and they did beat the Dogs as well late in the year. So, uh, any negatives that come to mind for you? Nothing too. Sort of like they've sort of like plotted along, plotted along, and it's sort of starting the fruit. So you can't argue with it. Like mm. I can't see yep. anything they've stuffed up to keep the process going for now. I agree. This was they were the hardest team to come up with for, in terms of negatives for me. Um, at times, m- maybe just a continued um, ups and downs. They sort of do see well, sort of a true. little still, but that's true. Their yeah. best was very good. Um, did they get walloped? I think they've. Cop one or two. Yeah, every team does. I, I think. Yeah. yeah, I think they did pretty well. Uh, I guess they got well beaten in their only final. Yeah. Um, which is again, you hard to really blame them for that first yeah. final with the well, not first fifth. final, but they were, yeah, inexperienced final side, uh, and the, that team ended up making the grand final as well. So, and it was horrible conditions. Um, at times, the scoring could dry up a little bit. Um, towards the end, they sort of you know found that Peter Wright option as well. Um, but that's something they continue to address. Is probably just the forward line options to go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's really nitpicking. How would you grade this season? I'd probably give them a B, B plus, something like that. Yep. Probably not quite the A because they didn't quite do much in finals and stuff. But they've done pretty much everything right. So I agree. B, yeah, B plus. I, I think you'd, have, you'd give them an A if they were horrible last year, and they weren't horrible yeah. last year. At times they were. I think it was last year they got slaughtered by the dogs um, by about 123 points. Yeah. Was that, that it was something ludicrous? Like, yeah. yeah, it was that, that last year. I'm sure. Um, so they, it was a massive improvement. I agree, B-plus is what I, I went with. In the off-season, they have recruited Jake Kelly, um, and so that sort of shores up a bit of a defensive gap they had. Yeah. I think they highlight him as someone who can play tall and small, so a bit yeah, of versatility. Yeah, tall, tall, dude, yeah. And then they tried to get Bobby Hill at the last minute and failed, but that's not really their fault. Yeah, yeah Bobby Hill waited too late to ask for that one. Exactly. They hold picks 11, 51, 56, and 87. Probably take three picks, I would imagine. Uh, and with pick 11, they can get, you know, potentially another best 11 player. Like Perkins was, what, pick nine yep. or something like that. So seven, eight, nine, pretty much their free picks I think last year. I think you're right. So, yeah, they have a potential to pick up another player like that this, this year. Finals again next year? It's a tough one because they're still, like, their key contributors are, like, not really showing consistency yet. So, there's gonna, I think there's going to be a de- degree of seesawing with them. Not unlike that poor dad. Port Adelaide team from like 14 where you saw them have a bit of success and then they sort of seesawed. It's mm. a, they're a more extreme example than what Essendon's probably going to do, but I think you will see that seesaw until yep. they're consistently in finals. Yeah, I, I think you, that sums up pretty well. I think when you look at the, the top eight, the teams most likely to sort of seesaw, as you say, I would suggest Essendon and perhaps Sydney just yeah, because Sydney's of how young they are. Mm. Sydney were a very, very good team. We will talk about them later in this podcast, uh, but just that's just well, the way... The way I see it in terms of, yeah, a young side that sort of bounced up unexpectedly. Um, I mean, I, I don't think Essendon will regress, but I also think there's other teams... Other teams couldn't leapfrog them. I was going to say, I, I feel like there's a lot of capacity for the other teams to leapfrog them. And I think in two years, well, they'll be a serious team. But I yeah. think next year is not necessarily the year that they take that step. So, I agree. 